The Spiritual Doctrine of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity Part 2 2. The Carmelite When Elizabeth Cates was shown into a Carmelite cell, she was heard to murmur, The Trinity is there. At her first community exercise in the refectory, when she had finished her frugal meal, Elizabeth was seen to fold her hands simply beneath her cape, then her eyes closed to fall into a profound mood of meditation. The nun who was serving, noticing her, said to herself, said to herself it is too good to last. She was mistaken. The Carmel of Dijon had possessed a saint. A week after her arrival at Carmel, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity filled out a questionnaire at recreation, which shows us her state of mind on the threshold of her religious life. The most characteristic features of her spiritual physiognomy are already clearly indicated there her ideal of sanctity, to live by love in order to die of love, her ardent devotion to the will of God, her love of silence, her devotion to the soul of Christ, the watchword of her whole religious life, to bury herself in the very depths of her soul in order to find God there. Nothing is forgotten not even her dominant fault over sensitiveness. The only things lacking are that stripping of self which will be the work of the passive purifications of the novitiate and the supreme grace which will transform her life by showing the meaning of her final vocation to be a praise of glory to the Trinity. What is your ideal of sanctity to live by love? What is the quickest way to reach it, to become very little, to give oneself wholly and irrevocably? Who is your favorite saint, the beloved disciple who rested on the heart of his master? What point of the rule do you like best, silence? What is the dominant trait in your character, sensitiveness? What is your bl favorite virtue, purity? Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. What fault of character do you most dislike, egoism in general? Give a definition of prayer, the union of her who is not with him who is. What is your favorite book? The Soul of Christ. In it I learn all the secrets of the Father who is in heaven. Have you a great longing for heaven? Sometimes I feel homesick for heaven, but, except for the vision, I possess it in the depths of my soul. In what disposition would you wish to die? I would like to die in an act of love, and thus fall into the arms of him whom I love. What form of martyrdom would you prefer? I love all forms, but especially the martyrdom of love. What name would you like to have in he heaven? The will of God. What is your motto? God in me and I in him. In accordance with her special grace, it was in the very depths that she, she lived her Carmelite ideal. She went straight to the essentials, solitude, a life of continual prayer, the consummation in love. A Carmelite is one who has beheld the crucified, who has seen him offering himself to his father as a victim for souls, and meditating in the light of the great vision of Christ's charity, 
She understood the passion of love that filled his soul, and has willed to give it as he did. On the mountain of Carmel, in silence, in solitude, in a prayer that never ceases because it continues through all else, the Carmelite lives as though already in heaven, by God alone. The self-same God who will one day be the cause of her beatitude and will fully satisfy her in glory is already giving himself to her. He never leaves her. He dwells within her soul. More than that, the two become but one. And so she hungers for silence in order to be always listening, to penetrate ever more deeply into his infinite being. She is identified with him whom she loves. She finds him everywhere. She sees him shining through everything. There is the whole Carmelite life to live in him. Then all the sacrifices, all the immolations become divine. The soul sees him whom she loves through everything, and everything takes to her, to him. It is a continual heart of heart-to-heart -heart union. Prayer is the essence of the life at Carmel. Her favorite point of the rule was silence, and from, from the very first she was delighted with the familiar motto of the early Carmelites, Alone with the Great Alone. As often happens, the first stage of the religious life of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity was marked by a flood of sensible consolations. The soul leads souls to the height slowly, taking them to Calvary by way of Tabor. Sister Elizabeth often went to her prioress, declaring, I cannot bear this weight of grace. At that time she would scarcely reach the choir and kneel down before being irresistibly enveloped in deep recollection. Her soul seemed to be immovably fixed in God. She passed through the cloister silent and absorbed, and nothing could distract her from her Christ. One day a nun saw her so seized upon the divine presence that she was sweeping that the sister did not even speak to her. Outside of recreation hours, when Sister Elizabeth was joyous and charmingly spontaneous in matter, chatting with the other with each of her sisters about what she knew what would please her, her whole outcome bearing showed a soul possessed by God. This recollection of her powers, as lost through, as though lost in God, is even caused by some involuntary forgetfulness during the divine office which she sincerely and humbly accused herself. She is visibly upheld by grace. So passed the months of her postulancy. Her clothing took place on the 8th of December, and Father Valet came to preach the sermon, completely given up to the joys of her total surrounding surrender to her master. Sister Elizabeth that day lost consciousness of what was taking place around her, being wholly absorbed in that Christ who has taken possession of her. In the evening, back once more in her little cell, alone with him, her soul exalted. A song of thanksgiving rose to, heart from, rose to God from her heart. For a whole life of love she was at last alone with him who is alone. Thus far divine grace has been showered upon her. She had yet, through weary days, to experience her nothingness to feel that she was a poor creature and capable of any failing and thus to become more understanding of her sister's weaknesses. For a long year God was to leave her to herself, 
to her helplessness, her weariness, her hesitation over her own future, even as to her vocation. On the very eve of her procession, a priest would have come to reassure her and declare what was God's will for her bewildered soul. Facility in prayer disappeared. No more flying. She had to feel her soul dragging itself along. Her artist nature lay dormant. Her sensitiveness was dying. Many, many times did the young novice go to her mistress and faithfully report her helplessness, her struggles, her temptations, the martyrdom suffered by her sensitive nature in passing through the terrible nights described by St. John of the Cross. To help in the accomplishment of the divine work, Mother Germain of Jesus guided her kindly and firmly. At the time of Sister Elizabeth's entry into Carmel, she had realized how excessively sensitive she was. In the evening, during the great silence, the young postulant loved to walk on the terrace, the sight of the sky helping to raise her soul to God. One evening, Mother Germain happened to pass by. It was the time of the great silence, so she said nothing. But the next day the young postulant heard these words addressed to her. We do not come to Carmel to dream in the starlight. Go to God by faith. Later on, in order to test her, Mother Germaine never lost an opportunity to reprimand her for the least shortcoming, the slightest oversight. Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity would then humbly kiss the ground and go on her way. Mother Germain of Jesus purposely disciplined an over-affectionate disposition which might have easily become dangerous. The brave child let her do so, for, from experience, she understood better than anyone else how necessary it was for her to watch over her heart at every instant. As a young girl, she had become extremely fond of a friend whom she met almost daily at Carmel, and had long, intimate conversations with her. She loved to write to her, and to read and reread her letters, especially the passages in which her friend declared that she loved her more than anyone else. This recalling of her girlhood's past in retrospect throws special light upon her religious psychology. Dear little sister, yes, let us be only one. Let us never be separated. On Saturdays, if you are willing, we will receive Holy Communion for each other. This will be our contract, and so we always be one. Henceforth, when God looks at Marguerite, he will see Elizabeth too. When he gives something to one, he will be giving it to the other too. For there will be but one victim, but one soul in two bodies. Perhaps I am too sentimental, dear sister, but I was so happy when you told me I was that sister whom you loved best. I love to reread those lines. You well know that you are indeed my little sister, beyond, beloved beyond all others. Need I tell you so? When you were ill, I felt that nothing, not even death, could separate us. Oh, dear sister, I do not know which of us, too, the good God will call first. Our union will not cease then, but, on the contrary, be perfected. How good it will be to talk to the beloved of the sister one has left behind. Who knows? Perhaps he will ask our blood of both of us. Then what happiness to go to martyrdom together! I cannot think about it. It is too good. Meantime, let us give him our heart's blood, drop by drop. There is a certain sentimental emotionalism in these lines, and, from the oral testimony of this same friend, we cannot but recognize that Elizabeth was excessively affectionate. Could anyone be astonished at weaknesses like these in the saints? 
Even St. Margaret Mary was momentarily held back by a too human affection for one of her sisters, for which the Sacred Heart approached her. St. Thomas, who was both a great doctor and a great saint, teaches that no one on earth can completely divest themselves of faults of weakness. Not even the most perfect can escape them. A fine book, and a most consoling one for us, could be written on the failings of the saints and the manner in which they corrected them, with God's grace aiding their efforts. As soon as Elizabeth Cotez perceived that her heart was not free, she heroically detached herself, but gently and with exquisite tact. Dear Marguerite, I can safely confide something to you, though I do not want to hurt you. You see, in the chapel with you this morning I realized that being there, together, was even better than our nice talks. So, if you are willing, we shall spend time with him, side by side, the time we used to spend in the garden. Am I hurting you? Dear little sister, have you not felt as I do? It seems to me that you have. Tell me quite simply. You know that you can say anything to your Elizabeth. After this generous act of detachment, this intimate friend told us, I felt her move away. Similar, something similar, but very much deeper, took place during the phase of passive pur purification which Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity underwent during her novitiate. All her senses had to attain this complete detachment which alone can set the soul free. No one around her, except her prioress, ever suspected this stage of purgative suffering. At that time, and everything which it would seem to have consoled her either left her indifferent or irritated her. Even a retreat preached by Father Valet, whose teaching, beautiful and profound as always, she truly appreciated, could not rescue her from this interior anguish. The priest himself no longer understood her, and, over and over, asked, What have you done to my Elizabeth? You have changed her. The work he did not understand was God's doing, and men could avail nothing. From that hard year of trials, Sister Elizabeth gained a more robust faith and an experience of suffering that would enable her to understand and comfort other souls who were being tested by God. The essential result of this period of purgation was to render her more virile and to establish her definitely in a spiritual life based entirely on pure faith, which could henceforth go forward peacefully under the eye of God, secure from any recurring faults of oversensitiveness. Physical health returned with the establishment of spiritual balance, and the conventual chapter admitted her to profession. She was informed of this fact on Christmas Day. As on all the most important occasions of her life, Sister Elizabeth took refuge in the all-powerful prayer of Christ in the Mass. This time, however, she most particularly sought his help, begging for a whole novena of masses from the venerable priest friend who had been the first person to whom she had confided her aspirations when, as a little girl, she had climbed upon his knee. Then Sister Elizabeth disappeared in retreat beneath her lowered veil. She passed like a shadow through her community halls, her face always veiled, and her sisters enveloped her with their prayers. But soon the retreat, begun with such joyous anticipation of her profession, became so painful as even to raise doubts as to her future and her vocation. It is necessary to send for a religious of wide experience who reassured her. Sister Elizabeth believed the priest's word as the voice of God. It is customary in Carmel to prepare for profession by keeping a sacred vigil the night before. Sister Elizabeth was in choir, wholly united with her Lord, 
beseeching him to take her life for his glory. Then the master visited her. During the night preceding the great day, while I was in choir awaiting the bridegroom, I understood that my heaven was beginning on earth, the heaven of faith, with suffering and immolation, for him I love. The new stage of her spiritual life was beginning. No longer would there be sufferings from a sensitive nature not yet purified, or scruples and anxiety over mere nothings. Henceforth she would tread the road to her Calvary with the peaceful and unshakable confidence of a bride who knows she is loved. She would go forward amid the most heroic sufferings with the majesty of a queen. Her profession once made, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity set herself in pursuit of religious perfection. Without the least sentimental emotionalism, but a new enthusiasm and a calm heroic strength which would lead her from sacrifice to sacrifice up to the consummation of Calvary. The whole program of her inner life was to realize her name, Sister Elizabeth, that is, the house of God in which the Trinity dwells. It is true that this seeking of the presence of God in all circumstances is the very essence of a Carmelite life and is in the re established tradition of the order. St. Teresa commonly recurs to it in her, in her interior castle. Intimacy with three divine persons constitutes the central truth of her mystical doctrine. By a special grace, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity found the most characteristic inclination of her interior life in that doctrine. Her letters, her conversations in the parlor, her poems, her retreat resolutions, all converge on this indwelling which was, if we may trust her own testimony, the beautiful sun lighting her life. The day I understood that, everything became clear to me. My only practice is to enter into myself and lose myself in those who are there. As the years of her religious life passed, her soul buried itself more and more in the tranquil and peace-giving trinity, which at every moment imparted to her something of its eternal life. At times, indeed, there were still some slight disturbances in her interior life, but more and more everything hushed to silence. It is the greatest happiness to live in close union with God, to make one's life a heart-to-heart -heart intimacy with Him, an exchange of love, to know that the Master is to be found in the depths of the soul. One is never alone, then, but must have solitude in order to enjoy the presence of this adored guest. Everything is lighted up, and it is so good to live. You ask me what I do in Carmel. I might answer that a Carmelite has only one thing to do, to love and pray. A Carmelite's life is a communing with God from morning till night and from night till morning. If he did not fill our cells and our cloisters, how empty it would be. But we see him through all we, we bear him within us, and our life is an anticipated heaven. The tranquil rhythm of this spiritual life is simple, constantly coming back to certain unchanging assen essential movements to be silent and to believe in love, who is there dwelling in the depths of the soul in order to save it? Many nights and weaknesses remain, it is true, but what do the involuntary waverings of a soul that live in the presence of immutable matter? Gradually everything grows quiet and becomes divine. So the life of Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity flowed on. In that fervent Carmel, 
where so many other great souls were living by God and for his glory, it must not be imagined that she was an extraordinary figure to be pointed out as the saint. It is the normal thing in monasteries to canonize religious only after they have been taken from the community. At Dijon, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity was merely the ever-faithful novice, who, like so many others, as a true Carmelite, was wholly hid in, with Christ in love. Three, toward transforming union. When on November 21st, 1904, under an impulse of grace and in a single spontaneous outburst, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity had composed her sublime prayer to the Trinity. It still remained for her to climb the last summits of love. It is not by chance that in the second sentence of the prayers, immediately after the first movement of adoration of the Trinity, Sister Elizabeth falls back on herself. Help me to become wholly forgetful of self. In the three years of religious life, one object had remained stubbornly insurmountable, her own self. She had not yet attained that supreme deliverance of selfless souls whose only occupation is to love. That was to be the work of the last two years. At first, during eighteen months of secret fidelity, it was slow and laborious. Then, with almost terrifying swiftness, beginning with that Palm Sunday, even when God descended upon her as a prey, coming himself to accomplish his work of destruction and consummation in her body and soul. Then the transforming union wrought in her, not on Tabor, but, according to her wish, in the image of the crucified, and being made conformable to his death. This most sublime phase of her life remains for us to analyze. For several months, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity had suffered from such exhaustion that, without the help of God, she would have collapsed. Before she was removed from the office of portress, she had sometimes to make a real effort to ascend the first step of the stairs to answer the call. She was worn out. In the morning, by the time we had said little pr the little hours, she acknowledges subsequently to her prioress, I already felt that the end of my strength, and used to wonder how I could go on until evening. After Compline, my cowardice was at its height, so that I was sometimes tempted to envy a nun who was excused from matins. I spent the time of the great silence and real agony, which I used to unite with that of our divine master, keeping by his side, to the choir grill. It was an hour of pure suffering, but it gained me the strength for matins. I found then a certain facility in occupying myself to God. Afterwards my weakness returned, and, without being noticed, I regained ourselves as best as I could, often leaning against the wall. At the beginning of Lent in 1906, after the midday creation, recreation, Sister Elizabeth, according to her custom, opened her beloved St. Paul at random and came upon this text, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. This last expression struck her, being made conformable to his death. Did it not announce her forthcoming deliverance? In the middle of Lent, the symptoms of a serious stomach disorder became office, obvious, and after the feast of St. Joseph, 
Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity was installed in the infirmary. I was sure that St. Joseph would come for me this year, she said, quite delighted, and he, and here he is already. A veritable crusade of prayers was begun, but in vain. The diseased progressed steadily. Sister Elizabeth rejoiced. Disregarding all consideration of secondary causes, she called this mysterious illness love's sickness. It is God who is working upon me and consuming me. I surrender myself completely, rejoicing in advance at everything he will do. On Palm Sunday, her condition was suddenly aggravated by a syn syncope, and a priest was summoned that night. With her eyes shining and her folded hand claps to her heart, her beautiful profession su crucifix, she repeated rapturously, Oh, love, love, love. I have seen many sick persons, declared the priest who gave her the last sacraments, but I never saw a sight like this. On Good Friday they thought she was dying, but the crisis passed on, and, on a holy Saturday morning, the infirmar infirmarians were astonished to find Sister Elizabeth kneeling on her bed. The return to life was almost a disappointment to her. On Palm Sunday evening I had a very serious attack, and I thought at last the time had come for me to take my flight to the infinite realms. To behold the un behold unveiled that trinity which had already begun my dwelling place here below in the peace and silence of the night i received extreme unction and my master's visit it seemed to me that he was waiting for a moment to break my bonds what ineffable days i spent awaiting the great vision to you who have always been my confidant I know that I can tell everything. The prospect of going to see him I love, his ineffable beauty, and the plunging myself into that trinity which had already been my heaven here below, filled my soul with immense joy. I cannot tell you how it hurt to come back to earth. It seemed so ugly when I came out of my beautiful dream. Only in God is all pure, beautiful, and holy. This violent shock had driven her nearer to the invisible world. Accustomed as she was to live above secondary causes, Sister Elizabeth understood the providential meaning of her illness from the very first. She saw the divine hand in it, the exceeding love which now, more than ever, was pursuing her. She immediately adjusted herself to the divine plan. If God has given me back a little life, she told herself, it can only be for his glory. God willed to set her firmly on the last peak of Mount Carmel, where, according to the celebrated sketch of St. John of the Cross, there is no longer anything but the divine honor and glory. Some months before her illness, during a license day in the summer of 1905, while talking with one of her sisters, she had found in St. Paul the name which definitely expressed her particular grace, Laudem Gloriae. Henceforth all the efforts of her interior life were directed to that end. The task might have been long drawn out, but God hastened it. It often happens that God allows souls to advance in divine ways at their own pace, then suddenly intervene and takes himself the direction of their lives down to the smallest details. Finally, under the impulse of an irresistible grace, he sweeps them into himself. He makes use of secondary causes. The great trial that shatters a life or an illness that seems to lead to death. 
In reality, it is the divine hour of Calvary, wherein all things are consummated. Thus it was for Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity. The attack that struck her down on Palm Sunday evening and Good Friday was the signal for a supreme deliverance, the definitive interest into the state of transforming union. From that time on, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity was completely detached from everything on earth, and here lived with a soul that dwelt in eternity. The nuns who knew her most intimately declared that it was a revelation to them of what it meant to be a saint. We felt her leaving us. We could no longer follow her. She was already a being of the world beyond. They watched her go forward on the way of suffering with a queenly dignity, to quote the expression of a witness who did not know that Sister Elizabeth had used the very same words. It was clear enough what was happening. As her physical frame was gradually being destroyed, her soul, more and more blessed, soared aloft and forgot itself. Day and night she was obsessed by a single thought, to be the praise of glory of the Trinity. She had only one desire now, to spend her life completely in the service of souls, and she dreamed of dying transformed into Jesus crucified. I am growing weaker daily, and I feel the Master will not delay much longer in coming for me. I am experiencing unknown joys, the joys of suffering. It is my dream before I die to be transformed into Jesus crucified. Although this soul was essentially Trinitarian, her last months may be said to have been haunted by the thought of the crucified. So true is it that, as St. Teresa remarks, the remembrance of the sacred humanity of Christ must never be effaced, not even in the highest mystical states. He who as God is the term, as man remains the way, Calvary is the only way to the Trinity. The constant yearning for the glory of the Trinity, which is the very keynote of a whole interior life of Elizabeth's soul, is, according, accordingly, closely mingled with the thought of Jesus crucified. Configuratus morti ejus. That is what still haunts me, that gives me the strength to my soul and its sufferings. If you knew the sensation of destruction I feel in my whole being, the road to Calvary is opening up before me and I am utterly joyful to walk it as a bride besides my crucified Lord. On the 18th I shall be 26. I do not know whether this year will end for me in time or in eternity. I ask of you, as a child of its father, to be so good as to consecrate me in the Holy Mass as a sacrifice of praise to the glory of God. Consecrate me so completely that I may no longer be I, but He, so that the Father, looking upon me, may recognize Him, that I may be made conformable to His death, and fill up in my flesh what is wanting to his passion for the church, which is my body, and then bathe me in the blood of Christ, that I may be strong with his strength. Thus Sister Elizabeth's spiritual life became increasingly reduced to the essential transformation into Christ by love, an almost constant fil filial intimacy with Our Lady, the realization of her baptismal grace in its special relation to the Trinity. Born away into the soul of Christ crucified, the activity of her interior life soon became extremely simple. The glory of the Trinity, that is all. Sister Elizabeth had reached that higher unity of the soul of those saints who have attained to the fullness of Christ. 
Everything else has either entered into this unity or disappeared. The palace of beatitude or of suffering is all one for her. Longing for suffering does not exclude longing for heaven, which she feels more and more as she reads over the last chapters of the Apocalypse on the heavenly Jerusalem, which are ever beside her. She had never seemed at once so human and so divine. Her tender affection for her sisters in religion was especially evident. Never did the heart of Christ so overflow at, as at the moment when he was about to leave his own. Nor have I, little sister, ever felt so keenly the need to protect you with my prayers. When my pain becomes sharpest, I feel so urged to offer it to you that I cannot do otherwise. Have you some particular need of it? Are you suffering? I give you all my sufferings. They are wholly at your disposal. If you knew how happy I am at the thought of that my master is coming for me. Death is indeed beautiful for those whom God has safeguarded, and who have not sought the things which are seen, because they pass away, but rather the things which are not seen and which are eternal. In heaven I shall be your angel, more than ever. I know how much my little sister needs shielding in a city like Paris, where her life is spent. St. Paul says that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and unspotted in his sight. How fervently I shall ask him that this great purpose of his will may be fulfilled in you. That it may be so, listen to the advice of the same apostle. Walk in Christ, rooted and built up in him. When I am contemplating the absolute beauty in all its brightness, I shall ask him to imprint print it in your soul, so that even here on earth, where everything is soiled, you may be beautiful with his majesty, luminous with his light. Goodbye. Thank God for me, for my happiness is immense. I shall meet you again in the heritage of the saints. It is there that in the choir of virgins, that generation pure as light, we shall sing the beautiful song of the Lamb and the eternal Sanctus in the radiant light of the face of God. Then, says St. Paul, we shall be transformed into the same image, from glory to, into glory. I embrace you with all my heart's love, and I am your angel for all eternity. The night of August 2, 1906, the anniversary of her entrance into Carmel, being unable to sleep, she settled herself near the window and remained there in prayer with her master until almost midnight. She spent a sublime evening. The sky was so blue, so still. The monastery was so deeply silent. And as for me, I went over these five years so filled with graces. Feeling that the end was near, Saint Sister Elizabeth asked her prioress to allow her to go into retreat the evening of August 15th, that she might prepare for her passage to eternal life. In a note slipped into the hands of one of the sisters, she says that she is going away with Janua Celi for these days of prayer and recollection. This evening, Laudum Gloriae is entering the novitiate of heaven to prepare to see, perceive the habit of glory and feels urged to beg Sister A to think of her. For whom he foreknew, St. Paul tells us, he also predestined to be made conform, conformable to the image of his son. That is what I am going to teach myself. 
conformity, identity with my adored master who is crucified for love. Then I shall be able to fulfill my office of praise of glory, even here below to sing the eternal sanctus while waiting to go and chant it in the heavenly courts of the Father's house. It was during these evenings and nights of silence with God, when she felt her master leading her to her Calvary, that, at the request of the mother prioress, she composed the last retreat of Laudum Gloriae, in order to explain how she conceived her office of praise of glory. Until the last week of her life, she used to drag herself to the evening office and, all huddled up in a corner of the tribune, she would exact the last measure of strength from her exhausted body. As far as her we extreme weakness permitted, she remained faithful to the end, to the smallest observances of her order. Frequently, during an interminable sleepless nights, she endured a very martyrdom of body and soul. In a strong spirit of faith, when she sought refuge with her prioress, whom she called her priest, appointed by God to consummate her sacrifice. 11 p.m. From the Palace of Suffering and Beatitude Mother dear, my dear priest, your little praise of glory cannot sleep. She is suffering, but in her soul, though the anguish reaches there, all is so calm. It was your visit that brought her to this heavenly peace. Help me to climb my Calvary. I feel so strongly the power of your priesthood over my soul, and I need you so much. Mother, I feel my three so near to me. I am more overwhelmed with happiness than with suffering. My master has reminded me that pain is my dwelling place, and that I must not choose my sufferings. So I am plunging myself with him into the immensity of suffering with all fear and anguish. October 1906 My dearest priest, your little victim is suffering very, very much. It is a sort of physical agony. She feels cowardly, so cowardly that she should cry, cry out. But he, the being who is the fullness of love, visits her, keeps her company, associates her with himself, while he makes her understand that as long as he leaves on, her on earth, he will give her suffering as her portion. October 1906 No matter how sharp the pain, no one ever caught her giving way in the slightest degree. Her lovely smile never left her lips. During those last weeks of real martyrdom, the gift of fortitude was made radiantly plain to her. One day she was asked whether the, she were suffering much. She made a gesture as though something were tearing her inside, and her face was convulsed. She, then she immediately resumed her tranquil serenity. It was in this state of exhaustion that, on April 15th, Father Valet saw her for the last time. He was struck at the work of destruction which God was accomplishing in this soul, and which was making it so strangely, so divinely beautiful. He exhorted her to make a supreme effort to raise herself to the love which exceeds suffering. Much comforted by this last visit from the Father, she scaled the half-seen heights, those higher states of transforming union on Calvary, which have no resemblance to anything that takes place on earth. On October 29th, thanks to a slight respite, she was able to go down to the parlor and see her family. They had brought her nieces, those two lovely white lilies, 
and their mother made them kneel down by the grill. Raising her perfection, profession crucifix, Saint El Sister Elizabeth blessed them. When the moment came to say goodbye, she had the strength to whisper to her mother, Mother, when the out sister comes, to let you know that I have finished with suffering, you will kneel down and say, Lord, thou didst give her to me, thou hast taken her away. Blessed be thy holy name. By the following day, October 30th, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity could no longer leave the infirmary. During the evening she was shaken in her bed by a violent fit of shivering. During the night heaven again seemed to be almost ready to open to her. There was no time to delay. The grace of the last sacraments was renewed very early in the morning. The church was singing the first vespers of all saints. No longer able to write, Elizabeth dictated a last message. I think the great day of my meeting with my adored bridegroom, my one love, has come. I hope by this evening to be among that great multitude whom St. John saw before the, Lamb of the, before the throne of the Lamb, who serve him day and night in his temple. Let us meet in the beautiful chapter of the Apocalypse, and also in the last chapter, which sweeps the soul beyond this earth into the vision where I am going to lose myself forever. At midnight all the bells of the town rang out. Oh, mother, she cried, those bells encourage me. They are ringing for the departure of Laudem Gloriae, and they will make me die for joy, those bells. Let us go. And she stretched out her arms to heaven. On All Saints' Day, about ten o'clock in the morning, the last hour seems to have come. The community assembled in the infirmary to recite the prayers for the dying. Sister Elizabeth roused herself, made sure that all her sisters were present, and then asked forgiveness of the community. Then, begged to speak, she uttered these words, All passes away. In the evening of life only love remains. We must do everything for love. We must constantly forget ourselves. The good God loves us to be forgetful of ourselves. Oh, if I had always been so. Then began nine days of st distressing agony. Stretched upon her bed as upon an altar, her eyes closed, all life concentrated in the depths of her soul, the saintly victim prayed constantly. When they tried to console her at being no longer able to receive the blessed sacrament, she said, I am finding him on the cross. It is there that he is giving me life. Violent headaches caused fear of cerebral congestion. The danger was averted by continual applications of ice, which melted immediately. Her brain seemed on fire. Her words, which were distinguished with difficulty, gave evidence of a divine union had already accomplished. Her face, wasted and unrecognizable, at times took on a startling resemblance to the suffering features of the holy face, recalling our Lord on the cross. Three weeks previously, as she had said to her prioress, if my master offered me the choice of dying in an ecstasy or in the ab abandonment of Calvary, I would choose the latter in order to be like him. Her master granted her desire to the full. Within as without it, it was the crushing agony of Calvary. After a violent attack she was heard to cry, O oh, love, 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 consume my whole substance for thy glory. May I be spent drop by drop for thy church. 
Two days before her death, the doctor admitted to her that her pulse was extremely weak. She was delighted and found the strength to say, In two days I shall be in the bosom of my three. Our Lady, who is all bright, will herself take me by the hand and lead me to heaven. The doctor, an unbeliever, was astonished at such joy. Sister Elizabeth spoke to him of the divine adoption, of the great mystery of love leaning down to us. These last efforts left her completely exhausted, but they could still hear her murmur in a sort of chant, I am going to light, to love, to life. Those were her last intelligible words. On Friday, November 9th, at a quarter to six in the morning, she turned on her right side and put her head back. Her face shone. Her beautiful eyes, which for a week had been closed and almost sightless, were opened and fixed themselves with wonderful expression a little above her prioress, who was kneeling beside the bed. She lay in angelic beauty. Around her, her sisters, who were reciting the prayers for the dying, could not take their eyes from her. Then, without having perceived her last sigh, they saw that Saint that Sister Elizabeth was no more. It was the morning of the feast of the dedication of the Lateran Basilica, one of her favorite festivals. While in choir, where lay her, her mortal remains, the sisters were singing the praises of the house of God, Beata Pacis Visio. Sister Elizabeth, already in the unchanging vision of peace and the glories of the heavenly Jerusalem, the thought of which had dominated her last days, was mingled with the throng of the blessed who, holding psalms in their hands, rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is to come. With them falling down, adoring and casting her, casting down her crown, the reward of her martyrdom of love, she ceased not to repeat before the Lamb of, for the throne of the Lamb, Dignus es Domini, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive power and divinity and wisdom and strength and honor. Before the face of the Most Holy Trinity, Sister Elizabeth had become the praise of glory for all eternity.